Um, okay, so I think we can start the last lecture on 2D CFDs. Um, so at the end of the last lecture, we talked about uh, the torus one-point function of primaries in the 2D icing CFT. Um, and we said that uh, because of Z2 symmetry, the torus one-point function of the spin field sigma is zero. Uh, the torus one-point function of the identity operator is just the torus partition function. And that can be uh, written as the sum uh, is a trace over, um, if, if you cut it this way, the trace over the Hilbert space um, of the icing CFT. Uh, this is trace of the Hilbert over the Hilbert space, Q to the L0 minus C over 24, which is 1 over 48, uh, Q bar to the L0 bar minus um, uh, 1 over 48, where Q is e to the 2 pi i tau. Um, and uh, that trace can be decomposed uh, into uh, the sum of uh, the, the traces over uh, just the space of uh, states that are very short descendants of a single primary, uh, the identity, the spin field, sorry, the spin field and energy operator. Uh, so each, in each case, this chi h tau is just a um, uh, trace over the representation space of um, uh, holomorphic Virasor algebra, uh, um, the representation of um, primary of weight h, uh, q to the L0 minus 1 over 48. Let's see over 24. Um, any questions about that? Okay. So uh, you know, I told you in principle what th this thing is, but because there are a bunch of null states, you have to subtract the, 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 those states off. The trace do not, do not take into account of the null states which are absent in the theory. Um, so it's not immediately obvious how to actually write the explicit formula for the, uh, for the Q expansion of this uh, chi H, um, the Virasoro character. Um, we'll discuss that in, in a second. Um, the uh, uh, torus one-point function, the energy operator, on the, on the other hand, um, if you look at its conform bl block decomposition according to uh, this, so, so if you cut it in this way, uh, that's, that's like a pair of pants decomposition. It's, you only have one pair of pants. You sew the two ends together. Um, and the only uh, conformal block that will contribute is this channel with a sigma running in the loop. That's because um, epsilon have another two operator. The triple function is only non-trivial for uh, epsilon sigma sigma, as we discussed last time. Um, and that uh, uh, three-point function coefficient, the structure constant, was determined to be one half. So I put the one half here, and the rest of the stuff is um, the uh, mod square of the holomorphic virasoro conformal block associated with this particular uh, shape of the pair pants decomposition of the uh, towards one-point function. Um, okay, so uh, this thing again, this f of tau, which is some holomorphic function of tau, uh, is uh, once again I wrote the general formula last lecture, where you can write it as an uh, expansion in terms of a sum over all the virasoro descendants of the sigma that propagates in this loop. But if you actually want to compute explicitly from that definition, it's uh, quite a mess. Uh, we'll discuss what this f tau is uh, in a moment. Um, OK, so, so first, let's, any, any questions so far? I have a question. Yeah. So if you started with a Hamiltonian or something like that, for Ising model, you would know immediately about this z2 symmetry on sigma goes to minus sigma. From this point of view, do you not see it until you get all the way to calculating all the OPE coefficients? So, sorry, uh, which symmetry? The sigma? Sigma goes to minus sigma. Uh, yes, you do see that, yes. So w w when, from this point of view, when do you first see that that symmetry exists? If you're not starting with a Hamiltonian or a Oh, you're not start, starting right, from so a Hamiltonian. If you do start that way, then you see it immediately. From um, this point of view, it seemed like you had to, you went through the whole story of calculating the conformal blocks to figure out what the uh, OPE uh, coefficients were. Uh, you see, oh, there isn't anything that, you know, that has only one sigma. Th th that, that's right. Um, uh, from the point of view of uh, conformal bootstrap, which is essentially you know, the point of view I, I'm taking here, I didn't really assume anything other than the center charge equals 1 half, and we have unitary representation of Virasoro algebra. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, this Z2 symmetry is an accident. It, it came, out, came out of uh, this uh, solving for the uh, allowed OP coefficients. I don't know if a um, simpler way to, to explain that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, let's discuss the Virasoro character. Um, so it turns out that um, there's a, a 
alternative way to represent uh, this, um, uh, the fields in the, the local operators in acting CFT uh, that allows you to just compute these, these things uh, uh, directly using uh, a so-called free fermion representation. So, so uh, uh, probably most of you, some of you have heard that you know, there's a, the sequence one half CFT is like a theory of a free fermion. The free fermion field in, in 2D, free masses fermion, is supposed to uh, be a CFT of center charge one half. Why am I not, not talking about the free fermion so far? Um, well, uh, you see, the, the fermion field will, be, will have half an integer spin. In, in this case, in particular, the spin will be one half. Um, and I've always demanded in the discussion so far that all the local operators of my CFT have integer spin. Uh, in particular, um, you know, all the states, uh, that is to say, the spin is equivalent to the angular momentum uh, of the state on the cylinder by the state operator mapping. And um, uh, the, the stores for the function, for example, is supposed to be invariant and the tau goes to tau plus one, which demands um, that all the states have uh, integer momentum along the circle, which translates to a statement that all the operators um, will have integer spin. So there is no free fermion field. Uh, so how, 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 do, how do you reconcile these statements? Um, well, um, so uh, uh, in fact, the answer is that there is a free fermion field, but it's not a local operator. Uh, it's what's known as a defect operator. Um, so uh, I'll explain this in a more, I'll put this in a more general context uh, in a moment. Uh, but for now, uh, let, let me declare that um, there's something uh, known as, that can be viewed as a um, free fermion uh, operator, which is a conformal primary, Versor primary of weight um, uh, one half comma zero. This will be a holomorphic operator. It depends holomorphically on the on this coordinates, uh, but it's not a local operator in, that, in the sense that it's attached to something uh, which is kind of like a branch cut from the point of view of taking OP with other operators. Um, this dot 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 this dotted line is a special case of um, what I would call. Uh, topological defect line. Uh, there are other names for this, this object. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, uh, the same topological defect line can be atta uh, attached to a anti-holomorphic fermion field, psi tilde, of weight uh, 0, 1 half. Um, in fact, th what this topological defect line is, um, uh, is there something uh, quite familiar. So. Um, uh, when I say it's topological, it means that if I insert this object into some quotient function, um, uh, the quotient function is supposed to be invariant if I move this line around as long as it doesn't pass other local operators. If I want to move the line past some local operator, I have to specify some, uh, some rule. Uh, in this case, it's actually uh, very simple. Um, so uh, this, this line, this dotted line in this case, is a line that in imposes the Z2 symmetry. Um, that we discussed before, uh, that is, um, if you uh, have this uh, spin field, which is odd under the Z2, and if you move this line across sigma, let's turn the sigma into minus sigma in any quotient function. So this, this line, of course, also has to end somewhere. Um, uh, either they have to end somewhere or have to close into a loop. OK, so they can end on some defect operator like psi and psi tilde, or uh, this line could form a closed loop, uh, in which case, if you have some operator O, and if you surround uh, this operator by this line, uh, that's nothing but the uh, Z2 action, symmetry action on this operator O. OK, so uh, in fact, uh, um, going in reverse logic, you could have said that uh, every global symmetry in any quantum field theory can be represented, let's say in 2D, can be represented uh, by some topological line in the sense that now if you have a continuous symmetry generated by some northern current, you could integrate the northern current along the line, uh, the, this loop surrounding the operator. We have seen this many times before. Um, and if the current is conserved, of course, you can deform that uh, line uh, arbitrarily as long as it doesn't pass through other charged operator. Um, the quotient function will be invariant under that operation. Um, now, uh, uh, we can also say this for discrete symmetry. Uh, well, in the discrete sim case of discrete symmetry, like the Z2 symmetry here, there's no northern current. Um, so you have to imagine there's some fictitious object like, like this. Um, if I only tell you 
that there's the Z2 symmetry can be represented by this loop surrounding the operator, that's kind of a tautology. It's just you know, some uh, uh, you know, trivial uh, mathematical reformulation of, the, of how the Z2 acts. Um, but um, the uh, uh, quite amazing thing about uh, local quantum field theory is that um, in essentially on all the nice theories we know whenever we have a global symmetry that we can represent by this action of this fictitious loop of the topology defect line in this way, uh, we can actually al always essentially cut this line open. I'm going to give you a, a more precise argument for this later. Um, uh, we can cut this line open in such a way this line can actually end on some defect operator. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's uh, for now accept the, the statement that uh, there are these um, uh, defect operators that ends on these, um, that are attached to these topological defect lines uh, in, that, that involve these uh, uh, operators psi and psi tilde, which behave like free fermions. Uh, if you were to uh, uh, describe the free fermion field uh, by quantizing uh, Lagrangian action, um, in Euclidean signature, you would write the action for the free fermion in the form complex coordinates would be something like psi partial bar psi plus psi tilde uh, partial psi tilde. Uh, and this fermion field has OP with itself. Uh, this goes like 1 over z plus, plus non-singular terms. Uh, likewise, uh, psi tilde z bar, psi tilde goes like 1 over z bar plus non-singular terms. So these, these things anti-commute uh, with one another. This, the OP of the free fermion field is anti-commuting rather than commuting as the kind of OP we discussed before. Um, and you can also write the stress energy tensor uh, as minus a half psi, partial psi, uh, likewise, there's t tilde. Um, now the claim is that uh, if you actually, so what this expression means is some appropriate normal notion of normal order product of these operators psi uh, and partial psi. Um, and the claim is that it turns out if you take that, you take this defect operator and take this normal order product with itself, you get the same stress energy tensor as the stress energy tensor of the icing CFT that we're talking about. Okay, um, so now um, uh, you see uh, if you now take the OP of this defect operator psi with uh, the fields that we know exist in our theory, which are uh, one sigma epsilon and their vectorial descendants, um, then uh, because uh, one and epsilon are z two even, um, if you put epsilon over here and move this line, moving this line past through epsilon doesn't do anything. So, um, in fact, there, there is a single value, the OPE, between psi uh, and epsilon. Okay? Uh, but um, the OPE between psi and sigma will not be single valued because uh, if you take, move, put a sigma near this, uh, moving psi around sigma, if you keep the line kind of extended in one direction, then this line will have to cross sigma, so with a flip sign. Okay, so, the, uh, so oh, or in other way, other way around, if you move a sigma around psi, it has to cross this line. So you have pick up a nine, you'll pick up a minus sign. Okay, so that makes it clear that uh, the OP of psi with sigma is not single valued. Um, okay, so uh, now, um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you take the OP of uh, psi uh, with psi tilde, just bring these two together, uh, well, uh, you'll get some operator. Uh, in the limit, if you take psi and psi tilde together, this OP, in fact, is non-singular. It's not hard to, hard to argue that. And um, this uh, pair of Z2 lines, if they sit on top of each other, they essentially annihilate each other because the Z2 square sy symmetry squares to 1. Um, so uh, if you take psi and psi tilde, bring them together, you get a local, well-defined local operator. Uh, and that local operator is uh, uh, nothing but epsilon. Uh, just by matching the weight, you see that's the only thing it could be, weight one half comma one half. So in this sense, we can write the energy operator epsilon as a fermion bilinear psi, psi, psi tilde. Okay? Um, so uh, then it's not hard to uh, convince yourself that um, uh, you can, in fact, uh, produce all states in the Virasoro, uh, in, the, in this representation space of the Virasoro descendants of one and epsilon, uh, by taking, um, uh, uh, by using a Fox space representation. So, uh, Virasoro 
uh, descendants uh, the, uh, the space of reversal descendants of uh, 1 and epsilon is equal to um, uh, the Fox space uh, states uh, of the free fermions of psi and psi tilde, uh, but it was with the restriction that restricted um, to even number of uh, fermion excitations. Uh, that's because uh, epsilon, both epsilon and the stress energy tensor involve a pair of fermions. T involves psi psi or psi tilde psi tilde, and epsilon involves psi psi tilde. Um, okay, and uh, um, you can write, uh, so in the presence of one or epsilon, this psi uh, uh, would be single valued, um, as we just said. Uh, so in the presence of uh, one epsilon, you can write a mode expansion of psi. Uh, um, a, uh, you can write a Laurent expansion in uh, uh, integer powers of z, but because psi itself has weight one half, usually you want to write this as z to the r plus a half, so that psi r, uh, when you look at uh, this as a uh, operator acting on the operator at the origin, um, is going to lower the conformal weight by r, uh, as, as before. Um, so uh, because we want to demand that uh, the the psi single valued in this case, uh, we'll write r to be um, half integer. Okay, so uh, then uh, uh, psi minus one half, psi minus three halves, and so on and so forth uh, are the raising operators that uh, sort of create Fermi excitations in this Fox space. Um, and, and and of course they are anti-commuting, so you, each um, mode can only have. Uh, can only have uh, occupation number uh, either zero or one, uh, and um, um, okay. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I think I was saying something. Uh, something slightly wrong here. Let me see. Uh, well, that, actually, what I meant to say, uh, okay, l let me write, write it the following way. So uh, uh, l let's say the space of holomorphic versus descendant because I want to look at the, these characters individually. So, um, so we take the, f uh, that would be uh, the Fox space space of psi restricted to even number of Fermi excitations. Um, and uh, if I have the analogous statement with, uh, okay, let me write it this way, of, of, a, of a state of weight zero, uh, uh, because I'm just talking about representation with the holomorphic verse or algebra, it will uh, it'll be the same in this case as the Fox space state of psi, which is even number from rank citations. Um, if I have uh, h equals one half, so I start with already a psi, um, then this will be odd number from excitations. Okay, so, uh, and um, uh, now you can do the counting. So chi zero of tau, which uh, is this uh, partition sum over uh, the versorial, holomorphic versorial descendants of uh, weight zero primary, um, would be, uh, so we have q to the minus one over 48 that comes along with the right. Um, and then, uh, if you have uh, uh, this partition sum over the entire Fox space of uh, holomorphic fermion, you have product n from zero to infinity, uh, one plus q to the n plus a half, uh, that come from these. Uh, uh, this corresponds to occupation at uh, uh, for uh, acting on the on, on the vacuum with psi minus r, where r is equal to n plus a half. Okay. And the occupation number is either one or zero, so that's the partition sum. Uh, but then uh, we have to restrict to the even number of Fermi excitation states. That can be done by um, taking this expression, uh, add to it one product of one minus q to the n plus a half, um, and uh, divide by two. So uh, as you can see in, in this formula, uh, so, so this corresponds to counting the Fermi uh, uh, Fox space states with a minus one to the f 
Um, and if I take the average of the two, I project down to even number of Fermi excitations. Um, and that's it. So, so that's, that's this chi zero. Uh, if, you expand, if you explicitly expand out this, this product and write the Q expansion, uh, you get the correct, you can check that you get the correct counting of the states in this representation space uh, with the null states already subtracted off. Yes? Uh, uh, well, uh, you know, for uh, the generic, uh, okay, so, so the question is whether uh, this uh, chi h tau uh, can always be represented using some free field representation. Well, you see, for generic uh, weight h and generic central charge, there's no need for, for doing that because there will be no null states generically. So you can just write a general formula. Uh, and uh, whenever uh, you have the degenerate ones, uh, generally it may not be some free field representation. There could be some other. Uh, uh, Representation, perhaps in terms of things like parafermions and so forth. I'm not, I'm not sure what this general story is, but uh, I think there should be some representation similar to this. Um, okay, uh, so uh, and uh, um, if you replace this by uh, one half, uh, you just replace this sign plus sign by minus sign. That would be the other character. Okay, so so th then you know what these functions are, um, and. Uh, uh, we can also uh, write down what chi 1 16th tau is. Um, uh, that uh, basically uh, can be understood as, um, well, if you take the sigma and you look at the free fermion uh, field size, the defect operator in presence of sigma, as, as we said, if you bring the side around sigma, it has to flip sign uh, because this is a Z2 line. Um, so in the presence of sigma at zero, <laughs> Uh, you will write the mode expansion, this Laurent expansion for psi of z, to be, uh, well, uh, a sum like this, except that now r runs through integers rather than um, half integers. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, you could uh, guess that this versorial character uh, of uh, primary of weight 1 16th uh, would be of the form uh, product so over Fox space states. 1 plus q to the n, um, but the ground state energy is supposed to be the weight of uh, sigma itself, uh, which is 1 16. Uh, so if, if you take uh, 1 16, subtract off uh, minus uh, 1 over 48, you get 1 over 24. So that's the answer for chi 1 16. And, and you can, once again, verify directly that this agrees with the, um, the counting of uh, uh, the, the, the states, uh, subtracting off the null states. Okay. Um, uh, now, uh, these uh, chi 16, 1 16, chi 0, and chi 1 half uh, can be, uh, they have nice modular properties, which is not evident from the infinite product formula I've written so far, uh, but if you, if you one can express this in terms of the Jacobi theta functions and uh, eta functions with well known modular property, and uh, with, then you can, with that, you can. Uh, 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 verify, uh, I'll, I'll let you check this for yourself, that in fact uh, chi 0, chi 1 half, chi 1 16th um, is a function of tau. If you t take tau to minus 1 over tau, if you do this uh, modular transformation, um, you get some linear combination of these things uh, again at, uh, at with argument tau. Um, and uh, there's some nice coefficients, 1 half, 1 half, 1 over square 2, 1 half, one half uh, minus one over square two and one over square two minus one over square two zero. Okay, so that turns out to be the modular transformation property of these characters, um, uh, and uh, you can then uh, plug in and verify that uh, the Perrin function at the top, which is the sum of these three characters mod squared, is in fact uh, modular invariant. It's invariant under tau goes to minus one over tau. Any questions about this? Uh, and importantly, if you were to, if you had missed any of these guys, for example, uh, you could have said that we let's forget about sigma. Why do we have, need to have sigma? This op of epsilon closes on itself. But if you forget about sigma, the sum of these two terms will not be modular invariant. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, psi with psi tilde. 
Uh, if we bring psi and psi together, you get the stress tensor. Yeah, psi and psi field. Yes. Uh, no, you don't get a divergent result in this case because uh, it just happens that uh, this has weight one half comma zero, this has weight zero, weight, weight zero comma one half, uh, and epsilon itself has weight one half comma one half. So the OP coefficient of epsilon is just one. There's no divergence. Yeah, that just happens to be the case here. Uh, okay, so um, now uh, uh, you can also determine this f of tau. I won't uh, uh, give you the uh, uh, well. Okay, so so uh, f of tau. See, uh, it's um, it's object that should start with uh, uh, q to the h minus c over 24, where h is the weight of sigma, which is 1 16th. So this starts with q to the 1 over 24. Uh, and then uh, there should be some expansion, uh, some number q, some q squared, plus da da da. There should be some uh, serious expansion in positive integer powers of q corresponding to uh, the various, uh, various order descendants of sigma that runs in this loop here. Um, now, uh, uh, what, what, of course, uh, if, you, if you assume that this uh, answer is, has the correct modular property, uh, which basically means that um, uh, uh, because the, the, the modular property as we wrote for the torus one point function is such that if epsilon has weight 1 half comma 1 half, uh, then this thing has to transform uh, in such a way that uh, f of minus 1 over tau is minus i tau to the power plus a half. This is the weight of epsilon times f of tau for the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part. Um, so this means that f is a, if this is the case, we say that f is a modular form of weight 1 half. It's holomorphic. It has this kind of q expansion that starts with q over q to the power 1 over 24. There's, in fact, only one such function. So f of, f of tau is uh, the so-called eta function, which is uh, q to the 1 over 24, product 1 minus q to the n, n from 1 to infinity. And that's it. <coughs> yes? Uh, what do you mean by zero modes? Uh, 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 very good. That, that's a very good question. So the question was, uh, what about the fermion zero modes? Um, well, I was being a little quick with the argument here. I was being a little slick. You see, uh, um, this thing is supposed to be the Virasoro character. So uh, it, it has to start with 1 plus da da da. Um, I think you're, you're, you're thinking about some uh, possible ground state degeneracy of the Fox space in this, in this sector, usually called the Ramon sector. Um, but uh, that doesn't, doesn't show up in, in, in this case. So the, the, the details of that has to do with analyzing exactly what the OP of psi and, and sigma look like. But, but you know that there cannot be any degeneracy because we're supposed to be computing the Versoro character. Okay, so <laughs> we, we can discuss this in more detail later, but uh, um, that, was, that was being a little quick. Okay, uh, good. Um, so, um, so that concludes our discussion of the 2D icing CFT. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, strictly speaking, I didn't, I didn't show you exactly why this is the torus one-point function. I just told you that if you have a consistent torus one-point function, this has to be the answer, but, but that, is, that is the answer. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'd like to uh, explain a bit more about uh, the story of the topological defect lines. Um, so as I said, uh, any global symmetry um, in a quantum field theory, uh, can be represented a, as a co-dimension one surface operator in a 2D will be, uh, will be a line operator, topological line operator. It's topological in the sense that you can uh, deform this line uh, as long as it doesn't pass any local operator, doesn't cross any local operator, or as long as it doesn't cross any other topological line, the current function uh, would be invariant. Uh, it turns out that that's actually uh, slightly more general than saying that you have a uh, global symmetry uh, because uh, so uh, global symmetry is an example of a topological can be is an example of a of topological defect lines in the sense I described. Uh, but the topology defined lines a priori is more, is more general because uh, if you have some operator O, you act it with this loop of this topological line. Uh, let's imagine there's some object like, like this in our theory. Um, and uh, if, if, it's, if this uh, loop realizes a global symmetry of some 
there's some um, element g, uh, you'll be able to take its inverse. So there's some kind of inverse line that can act on it to undo this. Um, it will turn out that the general topological defect line does not admit an inverse. Uh, we'll see an example of that shortly, actually just in the icing CFT. Um, uh, for example, it could be that this line acts on some operator will just annihilate the operator. <laughs> if that's the case, obviously you cannot take the inverse. Okay, so so uh, if, if you have such topological line, then uh, it would be uh, not a global symmetry, but nonetheless it exists in large class of theories we know, in fact even in icing CFT. Um, so uh, what kind of property should these topological lines obey? Uh, well, let's try to deduce the obvious properties that we can think of based on uh, the expectation that these things are supposed to behave uh, in, a, in this kind of topologically invariant manner. Um, so, uh, well, you can, you can take, it, take a loop of this thing and act on the oper operator. So the, by the state operator mapping, the, the pic the, this is equivalent to the picture of on the cylinder. Uh, you have some state, uh, and you can act on that state by, um, uh, by this line. So we call it L. It comes generally a priori comes from some orientation. You can take this L and uh, wraps around the cylinder, it acts on this, and produces uh, a, a new state. Um, the fact that this uh, line is topological means that uh, uh, it, in fact, uh, it has to. Um, uh, the fact that this line is topological is one can one, one can show based on based on that. that in fact, this. Uh, line is supposed to commute with a Virasoro algebra or commute with a stress en energy tensor. That's essentially uh, because um, you can kind of uh, deform, effectively de deform the line by inserting stress, en stress energy tensor near where the line is. So, so this, the, this um, uh, in, in my definition of topological line, in a 2D CFT, uh, in particular, this line has to be commuting with the, with the stress en energy tensor. So if, if you have a T inserted here, moving this line passing the stress energy tensor, it doesn't do anything. Um, so if that's the case, then uh, it must also commute the action of this, must also commute with all the Virasoro uh, generators. In particular, uh, if you take this and act on the operator, it does not change um, uh, the weight of the operator. So I'll denote this, the result of taking this line wrapping around the operator by L hat acting on the operator O. Um, so this L hat is now viewed as an operator acting on the Hilbert space. Um, uh, and as I said, L hat acting on O does not change the weight of the operator. If O is a primary, L hat O is a primary of the same weight. It could be some multiple of the primary, or in the case if they're degenerate primaries, uh, it would be some linear combination of primaries of the same weights. Uh, okay, so that all sounds very simple. Um, you can uh, take uh, so you could you can take you can imagine having two different topological lines, so you have L1 and uh, uh, L2, uh, and bring them on top of each other. So you cannot generally you know, cr cross, cross the, these two lines, the, the result will be, will be different. For example, you can have these lines that's associated with a non-abelian global symmetry, in which case the, the two lines will not commute. Uh, but nonetheless, you can bring one line on top of the, uh, the other uh, and um, uh, produce uh, this, the fusion. So the, the fusion. Um, I would denote by L1 product without L2. Uh, any, any questions so far? So it's obviously, uh, I, can, I can do this. Uh, as I said, this fusion is not, um, um, uh, uh, it's not necessarily, generally not commutative, uh, but it should be associative because this thing at the blogger doesn't matter if I have three lines, which order I bring these lines together should not matter. Um, okay. Uh, and, uh, Um, uh, so, so far, it's nothing kind of very uh, surprising. Um, so it sounds like I'm talking about something uh, quite trivial. Uh, uh, but here's the uh, a surprise. So um, uh, if you imagine some putting a CFT on the torus, maybe you can insert some operator somewhere and consider some coordinate functions. And suppose you can you have uh, uh, you consider now the coordinate function with this 
line uh, L wrapping the spatial circle of the torus, um, well, you can compute that current function if you know how the L acts on the, on the local operator as a loop, uh, because you can just cut it open along here, and uh, insert complete basis states, and uh, you have a trace, and you, you insert this L hat into the trace. OK, so, so this is this. We, we, we know how to compute. We know what it is if we have L, L hat. Uh, but now, by uh, modular invariance, we can replace this, uh, we can exchange the row of the, um, the space and Euclidean time of the torus and have the L running along time direction. And that should be the same thing. And uh, by the locality assumption, we should be able to cut it along the spatial circle here. Um, so now, uh, what do we get? Uh, well, we have we have to insert some complete basis of states here. Um, but these are not the states in the original Hilbert space, because um, this line pierces the, uh, the circle. So in other words, uh, the, 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 the Hilbert space we're talking about here is not the Hilbert space, the local operators, operators of the CFT, but it's the Hilbert space of the CFT on the circle with, so if you view this as a CFT on the circle, you have a topological defect point where this line crosses the spatial slice. Okay, so uh, here we have a different Hilbert space. A priori, we'll call it the defect Hilbert space H sub L. The original Hilbert space of the CFT can be viewed as the defect Hilbert space associated with a trivial line, this identity line that doesn't do anything. But for a general line, there'd be some defect Hilbert space like, like so. Okay, so uh, by state opera mapping, if you map this thing back to the operator on the plane, so the state operator map, uh, the picture is that you have a plane. Uh, this line, L, which runs in the time direction, is going to now run in the radial direction. And uh, there's some operator, uh, let's call it uh, maybe, let's call this state, capital psi. So there's some operator capital psi at origin, uh, which is a defect operator attached to the line. So we just argue that whenever you have this topological line in a CFT that's modular invariant uh, and have this locality property, um, you better have this defect Hilbert space and you have defect operators that, um, uh, 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 on which the, end, the, the line can end. Uh, and furthermore, uh, there's something uh, extremely untrivial about this modular property. You see, um, if I have no other operating insertion, this, the left-hand side is just the trace over the original CFT Hilbert space with the L hat insertion, <laughs> Q to the L naught minus C over 24, Q bar to the L naught bar, to bar minus C tilde over 24. Uh, the right-hand side, so after, if you do this, tau goes to minus 1 over tau, modular transformation, um, this is a partition function. Uh, of trace over the Hilbert space of the defect operators uh, of, well, Q to the L naught minus C over 24, L naught uh, Q bar to the L naught bar minus C tilde over 24. Uh, so this has to be some kind of partition sum uh, over actual states, or discrete states with, um, so this partition sum will be decomposed into various sort of characters with, with non-negative integer coefficients. So this is very non-trivial because left-hand side is L hat. They're not integers in general. It could be any, any number. Okay, so that imposes some very non-trivial uh, consistent condition on what kind of lines can exist in, in the theory. Any questions so far? Uh, well, as I said, this line generally do not correspond to any symmetry. They don't generally don't have anything to do with symmetries. Uh, if, if it does, uh, we'll come to that. Yes, uh, uh, so, so the question is, um, uh, the question is uh, whether the defined operator can be thought of some states where, you know, if you go on a circle, come back to itself after some symmetry transformation. The answer is yes. Um, but uh, we'll discuss this uh, in the general, more general context uh, in, in, in just a moment. Okay, um, let's see. So what other kind of properties 
uh, these things can have to obey. Uh, um, well, so let's analyze. Um, ah, actually, before getting into that, um, there's uh, so uh, th th this this fusion operation can be thought of as a product among these these lines, um, some kind of a priori non, non commutative but associative product. Um, there's also a operation of adding the lines, which is not to be confused with the fusion. Um, what this means is that uh, if you take if you take the, take the sum of two lines, or more precisely, maybe the direct sum of the two lines, I'll use the notation plus, uh, this produces a new topological line such that the, the uh, defect Hilbert space of L1 plus L2 is uh, just the uh, direct sum of the Hilbert spaces of L1 plus L2. OK, so uh, in other words, uh, for example, if I have uh, 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 the line L1 plus L2, then the partition function with L1 plus L2 is it just a partition function of with L1 inserted plus the partition function with L2 inserted? Uh, that's not the different. The, the, that's that's entirely different from the fusion. So the two should not be confused with each other. Okay. So I, I'm I'm allowed to to do this. You don't normally do this if you have the symmetries. So this that's operation is kind of uh, a uh, pretty ad hoc uh, uh, um, operation. Uh, but uh, you'll see uh, uh, that for the more general topological lines, is is some uh, natural thing to consider. Um, so uh, now, um, uh, uh, in general, if you have some Li and Lj, uh, if you fuse them together, um, uh, uh, it might be possible to write this as, um, uh, actually, let me just write, use the direct sum as a notation. Uh, it might be possible to write this as a direct sum of uh, lines that cannot be reduced further into direct in, into sums, so we'll call those lines simple lines. So it can be um, uh, sum over LK, and each one come, can come with some multiplicity. I'll call this multiplicity N I J K. So what this means is that the LK is summed with itself N I J K times and uh, summed over K. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, uh, associativity of the fusion is such that if you actually think of this as algebraic relation, then this, uh, this product operation has to be uh, associative. So that puts some constraints on this coefficient in IGK, which are supposed to be non-negative integers by definition. So these are uh, non-negative integers. Um, so um, now, um, if the uh, two lines Li and uh, Lj can fuse, uh, and if Lk is a summand in the fusion, then um, you can form a junction. So you can imagine that they fuse into Lk. Now, in, in general, they can fuse into they will fuse into the direct sum, but you can pick out one of them. So you can have a junction like this, and if the lines are all topological, there should be a topological junction. So we think of this as a topological junction or a topological operator. You can also imagine putting a defect operator with non-trivial uh, uh, versorial weights there, but let's consider the case where it's just a topological junction. By the way, I forgot to say one important point. Uh, the states in the defect Hilbert space, uh, they still form representation of the versorial algebra because the versorial algebra commutes with the line. But they don't have to have integer spin. That's because if you take tau to tau plus 1, this line doesn't come back to itself. Now it kind of winds around the circle, so uh, around the torus. So the, the states in this HL don't have to have integer spin, generally. Um, OK. Um, um, now, uh, one can show, I won't prove this. Uh, um, it's kind of intuitively reasonable, but we can actually, one can actually argue this more rigorously uh, based on consistent conditions that I'll, I'll tell you about in, in a second, that um, uh, in fact there can be different types of topological operators or topological junctions these uh, three lines can form. Uh, so there's an entire space, um, I call this Vij k bar, I call it k bar because this line is coming out, so if I reverse orientation I'll put a bar. Um, uh, I, I'll call this the uh, the junction vector space 
um, the space of topological defects, the topo sub topological sorry, operators of topological junctions, the three lines i, j, and k bar all coming inward um, uh, can meet. Um, and uh, one can show, uh, I won't prove this now, the dimension of this uh, junction vector space is equal to uh, this multiplicity n i j k that appears in this fusion relation. Uh, by the way, uh, if if the lines are associated with global symmetries, there is no n i j k and there's no sum. There's just one l k that appears on the right hand side. So, so the, this more than trivial cases, they, are, they, they, they do not correspond to symmetries. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, here's uh, something uh, uh, somewhat non-trivial. So if you have the junction of ij, uh, let's say, uh, you know, they fuse into, into something, let's call it m, and you can fuse this further with k and into, uh, let's call this l. Um, so uh, well, you know, these lines are supposed to be topological. You, you, can, you, can, you can deform this picture by bringing the, these two lines kind of close by together and then travel over there and kind of the, then it splits. Um, so there should be a way to represent this in, uh, this, in this kind of picture uh, with L coming in, I, J, K, uh, like so. Here's some sum over N, um, li like so. Um, now, uh, in what sense? Are these two, could these two pictures be equivalent? Now we said that in order to specify the picture, uh, in order to specify what this, you, you have to specify what topological operator or what junction vector you put at the junction. Um, over here, you also have some uh, junction vector space. Uh, so uh, the data of, you can think of this as, you know, you, you, you take this disk, you can insert this into any coordinate function with this topological line configuration. Um, so over here, you have a um, uh, on the left hand side you have uh, the junction uh, over space. I'll call it V uh, I J uh, uh, M bar uh, tensored with V uh, uh, M K L. Uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, on the right-hand side, I have V uh, J K M bar tensored with V uh, I and L. And th there should be a map uh, that identifies um, the tensor product of this vector space is summed over M to this summed over N. Um, uh, uh, this map should be uh, sort of linear with back to each of these vectors. It's a linear operation. Uh, I'll denote this by this abstractly by k, uh, i, j, k, l. Uh, so this is some kind of crossing transformation. I'll call this the uh, crossing kernel, uh, or I call this the I call this the h junction crossing kernel because this. I have a four-way junction in the, in the shape of H, but here I want to uh, orient in, in, in this way to make the picture clear. Um, in fact, a small subtlety which I haven't mentioned is that um, generally the, these things are not permutation invariant. So you want to, you know, you, there's a preferred choice of, uh, of a line that, that comes out. But uh, uh, let's not worry about that uh, subtlety for now. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, the, the, the statement is that um, if you uh, 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 if you have uh, if you insert this into coordinate function with some junction vector over here, uh, it's uh, equivalent. It's, it's the coordinate function is equal to this picture uh, where you you re, where, where here you uh, insert um, the topological operator that's the result of the action with this kernel. So 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 that that's what it means. Okay. <coughs> Yeah. So, so, so using this kernel, you can you can always uh, move this this conversion to, to that conversion. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit more on you know, how we can think about this junction as a vector space? When is there there's some state operator mapping. Uh, uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, if if you 
uh, so if you, if you cut along this circle here, um, you have, uh, by say, say upper mapping, you have the CFD on, on, the, on the circle with the, these three defects. Um, and uh, the statement is that there's a, uh, uh, generally, if the dimension of this, this, this vector space is not zero, uh, is not equal to one, there's a um, degeneracy of the ground states um, with these three line de uh, the, the defect points. And uh, um, uh, the, a top-low junction is, is one of those degenerate ground states. It's generally a linear combination of those degenerate ground states in the presence of these defects. Yes? Do you have four-way junctions that can't be represented as sums of products of three-way junctions? Uh, okay, good question. So the question is, yeah, can there be four-way junctions that cannot be represented um, in, in this way? The answer is no. Uh, the answer is no because intuitively, I'll just give you an intuitive argument since we're doing physics. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can you can always deform this into this. All right. Now this looks like a topological line here, and uh, so that turns into that picture. Uh, 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 yes. No. Uh, um, uh, yes, it, it will have underlined. Uh, uh, the, the question is, is this the fusion category? Uh, yes, there's underlying mathematical structure that is the fusion category, but there's additional data uh, to, to that, but the basic underlying mathematical structure is a fusion category. I haven't, um, you know, there's a essential cons consistent condition I'll, I'll discuss in, in, in a second that would uh, give it that structure. Uh, yes, there's another question. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the question is, uh, in the case of global symmetries, are the, do the non-trivial crossing kernel correspond to anomaly, uh, namely tooth anomaly? The answer is yes. Um, okay, so uh, uh, so these uh, crossing uh, uh, kernels, uh, okay, which are some which typically find some finite dimensional matrices, um, have to obey a non-trivial uh, consistent condition. Uh, that's the following. So if you have a um, five-way junction like this, uh, well, you can first uh, do the crossing o over here. Bring, so you can uh, bring, bring th this line over here. Uh, then you can bring this line over here. So you have that. Um, and then uh, you can uh, bring this line over here. to that by doing the crossing three times. Or you can first bring this line over here, like that, uh, and then bring this line over here, uh, which now produces the same picture as this. Okay, so here you do the crossing three times, here you do the crossing twice. They're not obviously equivalent, but they better be equivalent. <laughs> They're the same picture. Uh, so the, uh, the statement that these, these two operations, uh, this is equal to that. Uh, this is known as the Pentagon identity. Uh, so this is the key uh, consistent condition that these crossing uh, kernels uh, would have to obey. Um, and uh, 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 if they, uh, you know, if they do obey that, this is under this. Uh, kind of forms this, this underlying math mathematical structure known as the fusion category. Um, OK. Uh, I, I should say that it's uh, extremely non-trivial that uh, given a general fusion relation like this, you can actually uh, solve for these fusion, uh, these crossing kernels um, that obey the Pentagon identity. And typically, uh, the solution is rigid. Uh, you can, if you do have a solution, typically, you cannot actually deform it. Um, OK, so um, uh, this all sounds uh, pretty abstract. Um, now let me, uh, uh, so what does this have to do with uh, the icing CFT? So now let me uh, give you a non-trivial example of this uh, just in the icing CFT. So we already know that in the icing CFT we have uh, this Z2 symmetry, and there's a corresponding uh, Z2 symmetry line, which I represented by this dotted line notation. So this is Z2 symmetry line. I'll, give, uh, I'll denote this by the letter eta. It's just an arbitrary name. 
Um, so, uh, so we said that if you if you take the eta hat act on uh, for it takes one to itself, uh, takes sigma to minus sigma and takes epsilon to to, to epsilon. Um, uh, now the the claim is that uh, there should be a, a defect Hilbert space. So um, this is now we're talking about the icing CFT again. Um, so this is supposed to be uh, equal to uh, the uh, uh, or related by uh, uh, tau goes to minus one over tau transformation. So tracing the original Hilbert space of eta hat acting on all this q and q bar stuff. Um, so what is this? So this is nothing but uh, chi zero mod squared uh, plus chi half mod squared minus chi one sixteenth. <coughs> mod squared. Okay, so you know how this chi transform under modular transformation. I wrote this earlier this, with this three by three matrix. I invite you to check for yourself that if you do this trans modular transform, you'll get uh, um, something that is indeed a sum of uh, versorial characters, holomorphic times anti holomorphic, but they don't have integer spin. Uh, so, in fact, um, the, uh, this uh, defect Hilbert space uh, consists of uh, uh, three primaries. Um, uh, this already psi, psi tilde, at weight one half comma zero, zero comma one half, as you already know by now. Uh, and then there's another guy, uh, denoted by mu, uh, that has um, a weight uh, one sixteenth comma one sixteenth. So sometimes the mu is called a disorder operator in this context. Uh, it has the same weight as sigma, but it should not be confused with sigma uh, because. Uh, this mu, just like sine psi tilde, is an operator with the z2 topological line attached to it. Uh, by the way, uh, when this, this line corresponds to a symmetry, we'll call this uh, a symmetry line or invertible line, or invertible or symmetry line. OK. Uh, so. Uh, uh, this may not sound, uh, well, it's already very non-trivial that this Hilbert space, defect Hilbert space H eta actually exists. Um, but that may not sound very uh, impressive because, uh, you know, I've been talking about this much more general structure. Um, so it turns out that there's another uh, topological line of the icing CFT that's not a symmetry. Uh, uh, I'll call it N, so I denote this by this uh, solid line here. Um, uh, so in bo both cases, it just happens that uh, these lines are the same, e equivalent to the orientation reversal of themselves. Generally, these lines will come with some orientation, but in, the, in this example, the orientation is, um, uh, is uh, not relevant. Um, uh, so I, I can uh, describe the property of N in the following way. So uh, first, I should tell you how it acts on um, a local operator. You have an operator should act on it by this oper operation n hat, as we discussed before. And n hat commutes with a Versor algebra, so I just need to tell you how it acts on primaries. So acting in the, in the following way, a n hat acting on identity is equal to identity uh, times square root 2. Uh, n hat acting on epsilon is minus square root 2 acting on epsilon. And n hat annihilates sigma. Okay, so if you shrink this n hat, um, shrink this n loop on the sigma, um, you get um, uh, you get zero. You get zero state. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you move the line past sigma, you get zero. You don't get zero in that case. It just means that uh, you cannot really uh, pass this line around around sigma. So so if you if you try to pass this line around sigma, um, well, it doesn't want to. Uh, the sigma doesn't allow this this, this line to, to to pass. So you have to leave behind something. Uh, the something that it leaves behind should also be a topological line. OK? Um, uh, so, um, OK, so, uh, uh, so far, there seems to be some arbitrary choice. Why do I put the square root 2 here? Um, well, if you uh, compute a trace of the Hilbert space of n hat q to the blah, blah, blah um, 
And if you do the module transformation, tau goes to minus 1 over tau, uh, again, I invite you to check that uh, this is, uh, becomes trace over some defect Hilbert space Hn of Q da da da, Q bar da da da, um, where this Hn uh, uh, now uh, um, again uh, can be decomposed into you know, the space of virtual descendants of some primaries uh, of weight uh, 1 16th comma 0, uh, 1 16th comma 1 half, uh, 0 comma 1 16th, and 1 half comma 1 16th. So there are defect operators of these conform weights in this Hn um, Hilbert space. Um, you can ask uh, what happens if you uh, uh, take the fusion n with itself. So, so this is, I do know this by n squared, which is the fusion of n with itself. Um, so you can guess the answer uh, by thinking about uh, how a pair of the n's you know, act, act twice on the local operator. Right? So n hat squares, so if you take n hat, uh, so if, if you square it, uh, you get 2 here, you get 2 here, you get 0, I mean that's on sigma. Um, so n squared is the trivial line plus the z2, uh, the z2 line. Okay, so that's the fusion relation. Um, and uh, it's a, uh, some kind of, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun exercise to uh, actually solve for the crossing kernel. I won't do that on the board due to lack of time. Um, uh, you, can, you can try to solve for the actual crossing kernel that obey the Pentagon identities. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice exercise. Uh, OK, uh, any questions so far? Yes? Uh, Annihilates. Uh, uh, so the question is, can you find another topological analysis epsilon? Um, uh, I believe it's impossible, uh, but uh, I cannot give you a quick proof uh, at the moment. We can discuss that. Um, yeah. Is, is n the line that mu ends on? Or that, that uh, no, uh, mu ends by definition. Uh, mu, uh, so, so eta is the line that ends on mu. Uh, so you see, uh, n has to end on operators of these weights. So, so none of this operator has appeared so far. Did, did, uh, yeah, I have, I, have, I have not even given names to these operators. Okay. So there are some names we can give. Um, okay, so in fact, this uh, existence of the n line exi explains something um, uh, nice because you know we said that the icing CFT has a z2 symmetry, uh, the flip sign of sigma. Uh, there is no z2 symmetry of the flip sign of epsilon. Okay, because uh, otherwise, it would be incompatible with a three-point function of sigma, sigma, epsilon. Um, but nonetheless, if you think about uh, epsilon OP with itself, you know, there is no three-point function of epsilon. So epsilon, epsilon, epsilon three-point function is zero. So it sounds like there should have been some kind of Z2 symmetry, but there isn't. Uh, so what is going on? Uh, well, actually, that can be explained by this n, because essentially what happens is that if you move this n past epsilon, you flip the sign of epsilon. That's essentially, it's because you have this relative sign between this and, and that. Um, so, so this is equal to uh, minus of that. Um, and you can use that to leave it as a simple exercise for you to, 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 to you can use this to explain that the 3-point function of epsilon is 0. So this, this, even though these are not symmetries, it actually be, it, it functions as if there were symmetries in, in, in constraining the theory. Um, okay, so uh, I'm uh, uh, been going way slower than I expected, so I'm going to uh, only describe in words of the, some of the other things uh, I uh, was um, uh, planning to say. Um, in the case of, um, but I'm sure some of this you'll, you'll hear from the other lecturers um, in other contexts. Um, so. Um, uh, as Ingenio has already commented, um, in the case when these lines are invertible or symmetry lines, um, well, in that case, all these vector spaces are one-dimensional. So, and in fact, uh, and by unitarity, then this crossing kernel is in fact just a phase. Okay, so if the lines are symmetry lines, uh, the, all these vector spaces are one-dimensional, and this this thing, um, this crossing kernel is just a phase. Uh, now, uh, uh, you might imagine that you can. Uh, uh, 
uh, choose some uh, basis vector to get remove the space, but in general, it turns out that you cannot. Um, and the obstruction for doing that uh, is, uh, uh, well, this is discussed all in, in lecture notes, you can look at the details. So the obstruction in uh, removing these crossing faces simultaneously by some choice of basis um, is the group cohomology. In the case of the symmetry group G, uh, H3 with coefficients in, in U1. Um, this also classifies, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, what's known as Toft anomaly in this context, uh, because uh, if you cannot uh, choose some basis to remove this crossing phase, uh, then um, there's no un unambiguous notion of four-way junction. So um, you might imagine having some group element G, so G and H, H. So if you reverse orientation, it's like G inverse going in and H inverse going in here. Um, so you might want to form a four-way junction like this. Um, but as we said, in order to define this four-way junction unambiguously, you would like to resolve this in, into a three-way junction, either like this or like that. Um, but in general, if this group cohomology H3, G U1, is non-trivial, uh, there's no unambiguous way to resolve this. Different ways to, to resolve will lead to different uh, uh, notions of four-way junctions. Um, so if you put the CFT, <coughs> A, if a CFT has some uh, a symmetry group G, uh, there's uh, this uh, so-called orbifold construction. Um, you want to uh, gauge some discrete symmetry G. And what that means is that uh, if you compute any correlation function of the CFT on some surface, let's say on the torus, um, you would like to, uh, by gauging the group G, uh, means that, uh, first of all, you like to project um, uh, your Hilbert space onto those uh, states that are G invariant. So you, you, can, you can achieve that by inserting all the possible symmetry lines and take the average. So you can sum over uh, G, this symmetry lines act on a special circle. Uh, but uh, if that's your theory, it's not going to, be, going to be modular invariant. You also have to wrap this line uh, along time direction, say H, so there's also a sum over H. Uh, but then you have this four-way junction, um, and uh, uh, modular invariance re requires that you have this uh, unambiguously defined four-way junction. If you have a two-fold anomaly, this, there's no way to define unambiguously four-way junction, um, that this orbifold construction will not be consistent. <coughs> so, so in the sense that uh, it will be anomalous to, to gauge the symmetry, that's why it's called, why this is a two-fold anomaly. Uh, and, uh, and on top of that, uh, in fact, even generally, if you're given the group G, uh, there are different Overflow constructions, because even if the four junction is consistent, there still might be uh, different ways to um, uh, to assign what the four junction is by choosing the appropriate junction uh, vectors or the topological operators at the junction. Um, uh, any equivalent choices of that turns out to be captured by a different group cohomology H two, uh, and that in the context of orbifold construction is known as discrete torsion. So. If, it, if H2 is not trivial, then there's a possibility of constructing different orbifolds of the CFD by the same group G, by the same global symmetry G. Um, okay, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, 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 of uh, L, K, so, so L goes inwards, K goes up, L okay. goes down, yes? yes. Sorry, so, um, so is there like a relation between incoming and outgoing and taking some sort of, uh, some concept of dual and uh, is it a, actually a dual, uh, what, what, is, is it a representation of something? Uh, there, there is a well-defined uh, orientation, there's a kind of well-defined well orientation reversal because you're supposed to be able to uh, have this junction of, uh, of the, the, the line with this itself with the, with the trivial line. So, so, so in that sense, yes, yes, there, there is. Uh. So, um, is it also true in non-unitary CFTs? Can you also define parallel junctions with the uh, well-defined dual objects? Uh, uh, the, the, there are certainly many examples in which you, you can. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, in general, uh, uh, you know, I'm not trying to. Here, I'm not trying to classify all the possibilities. I'm just saying that you know, if, if you happen to, to, to see this line, you can, you can, you can make use of them. Um, okay, so um, uh, um, 
almost all the time, uh, instead of, uh, well, let's see. Uh, Um, m maybe I should, uh, instead of talking more about topological lines, I should uh, just give a uh, brief overview of what other c constructions are there for 2D CFTs, since we've been focusing on, on asking CFT, and I feel like uh, <coughs> for those of you who are not familiar with 2D CFTs, I should at least just give you a catalog of known constructions, and uh, so that at least <coughs> you know what's known and what is uh, not known out there. Um, <coughs> um, so. Uh, so the item CFT we talked about uh, belongs to this class of minimal models, uh, minimal models uh, with c equals one half, uh, seven tenth, uh, four fifth, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, this is the, you call the critical icing model, critical icing CFT. Uh, this one is the tricritical icing. Then you have the tetracritical icing and pentacritical icing, and so on and so forth. Um, as c equals four fifth, actually there are two different in equivalent CFTs, uh, one is usually called the critical, well, the, the, called the tetracritical icing, the other one is called the critical three-state POTS model. <coughs> they have different spectrum, the same tonal charge, um, and so forth. Um, this belongs to a, a more general class of uh, theories known as, um, known as rational uh, conformal field theories. Um, I will uh, not really discuss, I uh, don't have time to discuss this in detail, obviously. Uh, the rational conformal field theory is generally characterized by the property that uh, there is a uh, extension of the Virasoro algebra. Well, sometimes the, just the Virasoro algebra itself, but more generally, you can have an um, extension uh, of the Virasoro algebra uh, in the sense that there are other uh, conserved holomorphic currents of some integer spin, um, and that generates a, a bigger uh, purely holomorphic um, um, or I can call Cairo uh, vertex operator algebra, um, and with back to that bigger algebra, there are finitely many um, uh, uh, representations, or the finitely many primaries with back to this bigger algebra in, in, in the theory. Um, so, uh, in uh, Greg Moore's last lecture last week, the conformal block he was talking about are of that type. So, the conformal blocks in, in Greg Moore's lecture were, are not very sort conformal blocks that I've talked about so far. They are conform conformal blocks associated with the current algebra, which is a bigger vertex algebra. Um, so, uh, now the explicit construction of an example of rational conformal field theories um, is typically uh, based on uh, something known as a WZ of the model, uh, uh, which can be thought of as some uh, nonlinear sigma model with the target space uh, that's a group manifold uh, with some appropriate flux turned on from the point of view of a nonlinear sigma model. Um, uh, there's some, uh, you, can, you can take a WZ of the model and you can gauge some uh, subgroup symmetry H and produce, and, and then flow to the uh, flow to the infrared. So you can gauge it with some uh, Yamio's coupling and then flow to the infrared, you get some uh, new fixed points. Um, that turned out to be uh, often exactly solvable. Um, these are called uh, coset models. So the, these are also uh, CFTs. Um, and uh, so this taking WZ model together with coset model and their orbifolds produces um, essentially uh, all the known examples of um, uh, rational conformal field theories. It's not, it's, not, it's not clear whether they are all the rational conformal field theories, but they are essentially the only known ones. Um, they are, uh, we can also talk about free theories, of course. Um, but uh, in fact, even just if you talk about free boson, as uh, Joe May has uh, mentioned in his lecture, um, uh, you have to impose this uh, compact uh, target. Generally, you, want to, you like to put it on the compact target space. Otherwise, you end up with a theory with continuous spectrum. We can talk about those theories. But typically, you like to uh, consider the free boson with compact target, target space. Um, and if you have multiple free bosons, uh, the, the, there's a general construction known as the Narain lattice. Um, uh, that is, uh, it turns out that if you take some lattice of some signature uh, embedded in R, NL, comma, NR, if the lattice uh, is, um, uh, is embedding such that the lattice is uh, uh, so-called integral lattice even and uh, self-dual, or also known as unimodular, you can, uh, for every such lattice, you can associate a, a version of a free boson theory um, that will describe uh, inequivalent CFT if the lattice embedding is inequivalent. Uh, 
so you have these uh, family of continuous family of free theories associated with different ways to embed the lattice into uh, some uh, space of Minkowskian signature. And, and, and left and right, and, and left and, and right will be the left and the right center charge of the, of the resulting free theory. Uh, let's see. Um, you can, uh, one can also discuss the more general nonlinear signal model, uh, which will be described by some uh, action like uh, MGIJ, as you have seen nonlinear signal model before um, in these uh, in other lectures. Uh, so on the curved uh, um, uh, 2D Euclidean space time, you can write an uh, action like this. Uh, you can add some other term, bij, uh, epsilon ab, partial a xi, partial b xj, um, and uh, a coupling to the uh, background uh, Ricci curvature of your 2D space time, phi, multiplied by some function phi of x. So this, this is the sort of a general uh, nonlinear signal model action you can write down. Um, it, it's, um, if you try to quantize such a theory, uh, it, it's generally not conformally invariant. Uh, it becomes conformally invariant if certain um, uh, conditions are satisfied, which are uh, roughly equivalent to the vanishing of a beta function for this gij, vij, and uh, phi as um, function of x that capture an infinite uh, uh, set of couplings. Um, the precise uh, details of this is, is somewhat elaborate. Um, you can at least perturbative, you can treat this using dimensional regularization. Um, there's a section in the lecture notes that uh, discusses this with some references that you can, you can look at. Um, uh, so, <coughs> okay, so uh, uh, you know, typically all these W0 models and cosine models can all be captured by this nonlinear sig model construction. But if you have nonlinear sig model, it doesn't allow you to give you the exact solution of the CFT because you know, this usually is only um, useful for uh, working perturbatively uh, with uh, some, a few exceptions. Um, okay, and uh, uh, what else is there? Uh, um, there is, um, uh, it, there's also the possibility of uh, deforming the nonlinear signal model by some other uh, local Lagrangian uh, that makes things somehow uh, conformally invariant. Uh, an example of this is uh, in the case of a single field, scalar field. Um, uh, you can have some uh, linear coupling to the background uh, Ricci curvature, uh, and you add some <coughs> appropriate uh, potential term uh, that uh, can actually be conformally invariant in, if, you, if you quantize the theory. Um, uh, the, the, the result, the quantization of this leads to the so-called Luvial CFT. Um, it's a CFT with a continuous spectrum. And so if, if you put this theory uh, on, the, on, the cylinder, on the cylinder, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the states, if you look at the zero mode of phi, uh, it's similar to a quantum mechanics with an exponential potential. Like v is equal to the power eta to be phi. Uh, and the states are basically a scattering state that bounces off this potential. So there's a continuous spectrum uh, of various sort of primaries in this theory labeled by the momentum of this asymptotic scattering state for this theory on the cylinder. Um, and this theory turned out to be exactly solvable. The technique to, s to solve this had to do with uh, energy continuation in this momentum P. And if you continue the, this primary to some complex value of P such that the primary admits a null descendant, um, in this theory it happens that that continuation should be thought of as a zero operator. And using that, it turns out one can, one can solve the theory. So there's another section in the notes about, about this. I obviously won't have the time to discuss that in any sort of detail. Um, and uh, uh, one more thing I will mention is uh, super conformal field theory, uh, which is kind of a useful um, construction for a large class of uh, uh, 2D CFTs. You can have n equals 1 super conformal algebra, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic independently. Um, uh, so Clay last week talked about the uh, the super Poincare symmetry algebra, you can, if you have super Poincare and the Virasoro, they generate this bigger super conformal algebra or the super Virasoro algebra. There's n equals 2 super conformal algebra. There's also n equals 3, uh, which we don't usually talk about, like to talk about. There's also n equals 4. In this case, there are two different kinds. There's so called a small and large n equals 4 algebra. They come with different R symmetries. Um, so <coughs> if you <coughs> start from n equals 2 and, and, and onwards, 
if you have two comma two, so if n equals two on the left and n equals two on the right, um, it turns out that <coughs> for such superconvolved theories, um, uh, if you have a marginal deformation, if you have an operator that that gives you a marginal deformation that preserves n equals two comma two supersymmetry, then it's exactly marginal. So there's a non-renormalization theorem that says that marginal implies exactly marginal for n equals 2, 2 super comma symmetry. So this allows you to construct a large class of families of uh, interacting uh, exact uh, conformal field theories with that um, uh, uh, 2, 2 super conformal symmetry. And generally, those class of theories would not be of the rational type. Uh, and uh, finally, <coughs> there are uh, RG flows uh, between the various theories. Uh, uh, a lot of the RG flows uh, that are known are either integrable, integrable or flow are flows between among the known theories. For example, um, these uh, minimal models, uh, at least the, the, the so-called diagonal minimal models, which are this you know, icing, uh, tricritical icing, and tetracritical icing, pentacritical icing, and so forth, uh, admit um, Landau-Ginsberg description, uh, where you take uh, uh, you know, the Lagrangian for a single scalar field, uh, and you add some for example, for the icing, you can take phi to the fourth, and you fine-tune away the uh, phi squared term. Uh, then this thing uh, flows to a non-trivial CFT in the infrared, uh, which is uh, nothing but this sequence one half icing CFT we're talking about. You can fine-tune away the phi to the fourth, leaving phi to the sixth, and that leads to the tricritical icing, and, and so on and so forth. So there are all these RG flows among the known theories. Um, there are also RG flows among uh, Starting from a known CFT to some non-trivial infrared fixed point that's not known, I and mean, that's fairly ge generic in higher dimensions. Now, in 2D, um, uh, you know, because we, we know a large family of CFTs exactly, a lot of the RG flows you can try to either flow to the massive phase or flow to some known critical point. Um, but there are also a large class of examples where the RG flow flows to some uh, fixed point that is yet uh, unknown. An example of that is the so-called um, coupled path model. Uh, I won't have. I'm out of time, so I won't discuss that. I, I invite you to, uh, to to look at that because um, the, the 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 point is that uh, just like in higher dimensions, where you can have um, you know the various you know RG flow like the OM model, where you start with some some known theory, the RG flow ends up with some uh, strongly coupled critical points that's not yet known to be exactly solvable. Uh, in 2D, uh, <coughs> there are also plenty of examples of RG flow that flow to these fixed points, which are not known to be exactly solvable. An um, interesting example is this coupled path model. So if you take uh, n copies of uh, the uh, non-diagonal minimal model, which is a three-state path model, you can deform by some operator that couples these n copies together, and they, th this RG flow goes to a new, new fixed point. Um, there has been some <coughs> uh, uh, interesting work in trying to study that flow using um, uh, conformal perturbation theory. but uh, the results, as far as I know, is um, uh, not conclusive. Uh, I mean, it's believed that there's an true fixed point that, that exists, but we don't know the exact scaling dimensions of operators. Uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, OK, yeah, yes. Uh, that's a good question. So the question is, in, in general, is there a, rule, a relation between the fusion rule of primaries and the fusion rule of the um, uh, uh, topological defect lines? Uh, the general answer is no, because the fusion rule of the primaries in the context of rational CFT is always commutative. And the, these fusions are not commutative. So even if you have another being global symmetry, you would not be of that type. Um, if you have a rational CFT based on a diagonal modular invariant, uh, there is a subclass of um, topological lines uh, uh, that do obey uh, such property, usually known as Verlinda lines. Um, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, the primaries of uh, whatever the chiral vertex operator algebra um, of that rational theory that you have. But, but in general, the, the, there are other things. Um, yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, OK, so the question is about the integrability of minimal models. Um, uh, so in some sense, the existence of the null states uh, reflects some kind of integrability. It says that there's some uh, charges that annihilate uh, some uh, pri primary operator in, a, in an unexpected way. Um, this integrability manifests itself uh, a, a, if you consider massive deformations. 
So, uh, um, uh, you know, because uh, it, it, 